My name is Ariel. I'm an evangelist for Allegro AI. Um, just in case you miss anything, I'm going to share the link to the slides directly at the end of this session. So you can uh, go ahead and revisit. If you have questions that I haven't or will not answer, uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, Reddit, LinkedIn. It's the same handle everywhere. It's LSTMYAO. Many of you have taken the opportunity to do so, and I'm glad. Uh, it's been some very nice talks uh, coming from the, this series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about something kind of new, at least for me. It's called Pipelines for Research, and I've named it This is the Way, uh, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Uh, but first, we begin with the um, obligatory two slides about the company and make it quick. Uh, it's a serious company doing machine learning and deep learning lifecycle management. Uh, the most inter interesting thing for you guys is that we have an open source experiment management uh, uh, platform called Allegro Trains, which is awesome and you should check it out. Um, another thing that I always put in here is the list of uh, uh, industry leaders who we have dealings with, because this gives me credibility that what I'm saying is coming from experience. In this case, uh, what I'm going to show you is kind of a response to the things that I've seen in, in the transition from uh, production, research to production. Uh, so it's uh, not that uh, um, based on experience, but more on uh, uh, expertise. And this is the obligatory, um, um, in this case, uh, disclaimer and apology. Uh, this is really research oriented. It's, you will benefit from it if you have any research role or research facing role. So sorry data engineers, I'm not going to discuss robust data, data pipelines, um, but you guys are you know, our knights in shining armor. Uh, now, if, in case you're in the future and you're watching this on YouTube, uh, this uh, webinar is about how we are already using pipelines for our research. Uh, but there are different kinds of pipelines and we want to know that we're using the correct ones that will maximize our benefits. Uh, what do we need in order to use them? And we're going to introduce a kind of new, new idea of how to build pipelines, uh, which is really uh, fitting for research. Okay, so let's begin with what's so special about pipelines. Why everybody's talking about pipelines? Uh, well, it's a universal programming paradigm stuff goes in, stuff goes out, something happens in the middle. It's all very well controlled. Uh, it's, and it also really fits data-driven processes. For example, for example, machine learning pipelines. And not every pipeline is a machine learning pipeline. It's a machine learning pipeline if it consumes data and there are some multiple steps and the steps are straightforward and dependent only in the data or in intermediate models. Uh, also, most machine learning pipelines take a while and all of them result in a model, okay? So the basic uh, uh, machine learning pipeline we've all seen, uh, you get a data set, you train it, you, you do validation on the model, and then you store the model for further use in some hub. I call it data set in, model out, demo. Uh, and, you know, when I'm saying get data set, this is really easier said than done, right? Because most often it's uh, another pipeline. It's this data pipeline I was discussing. Uh, in, academ in academic settings, it's much easier, but uh, most of the work uh, in, the, in business facing machine learning is in this part, which we will ignore for today. Um, sorry. Um, however, you've seen these pipelines and you, if you download the repo from GitHub, you would get this pipeline and you have to do it manually. Uh, the complete opposite is an automatic pipeline, but in terms of schematics, it's the same, okay? This is your, uh, look at the amount of quotes here, a typical production end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. Uh, and I like this image because it comes from NVIDIA, which sells you hardware and not software. So in terms of the software you need, it's kind of agnostic. And you see that it's exactly the same thing. Data comes in, Something happens here. I don't know, there's uh, many nice figures. Uh, and then you do some validation and then you put it away for further use or you actually use it. 
Uh, if you look closely, there are some feedback lines, triggers and controls over it, but uh, the overall gist is uh, a single uh, linear pipeline. But, you know, both of these, they, they don't say much. It's really abstract. Uh, they're so abstract that if we take something that I like, for example, like making coffee, um, then the, the same abstractness of making coffee is translated like this, right? You have, you take coffee beans and you take water and then there, something happens in the middle and in the end result, you get coffee. It tells you nothing about the quality of the coffee and how it's actually made. Uh, and if we go to the manual side of coffees, you have something that I like, it's the French press. The French press is the ultimate manual pipeline uh, for coffee because you start with the coffee grounds. Again, the same way that we have with the data, I'm not asking how did you get the, obviously there's a very complex supply chain to get the coffee grounds to you. And the hot water, well, there's the parameter that I don't, we even discussed which, which temperature it is. But you start from these, and then there are a bunch of steps which don't matter a lot. And in the end, you get the coffee. The coffee is pretty great, but you will never get the same coffee twice. And that's a problem when, it's a problem when you're trying to scale up your process. When you want to do things many, many times and you want to ensure a level of quality, uh, it really is hard in this way. Uh, and the industry, industry converged on a solution and the solution is the capsule coffee. Um, and the capsule coffee is the complete opposite. You have predetermined amount of content and you don't even care about the temperature of the water because the machine takes care of it. You press a button, you get, well, I guess you can call it coffee. Uh, the most important thing about it, it's, it's drinkable and it's the same every time. So we have made a huge compromise, but if you see the, the numbers that they are selling, nobody cares, right? Because you can get a decent level of quality of coffee by pressing one button. And this is exactly what's happening with machine learning pipelines, okay? A machine learning pipeline is an element in a much bigger machine, which takes, the, takes charge of taking the data and processing it to create a model, uh, trying to conform to some uh, decent level of quality without any moving parts, no serviceable parts, and definitely not research. And when I realized that it's just a uh, really well encapsulated uh, machine learning, uh, really well uh, encapsulated machine learning code, um, I understood that there's a parallel between this machine learning and the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian has a helmet on and the code of the Mandalorian states that he will not remove the, the helmet in front of a sentient being. And if he does so, he may never put it back on. That's exactly the machine learning processes. If you want to go into production, you put your helmet, you put an encapsulation on, and if you remove it, if you go back to research, it's no longer in production, it's no longer allowed there. Okay, um, this is the way for production. And then I realized, you know, how content are we if we want to uh, use uh, research in an encapsulated way? How content are we with this Mandalorian way? Um, and actually, we want research to be as flexible as possible. And why should we even use pipelines, right? Let's stop and see if there are questions in the chat because this is kind of new for me. And I want to make sure that everybody understood everything. There's a commercial there, I think. Yeah, okay, so let's continue. Okay. Um, so let's first discuss the differences between production and research. Well, the most obvious differences are here, okay? In research, you have a data set that almost never changes and almost is a, a, a overstatement. Um, and then you have probably one final model. You do have a lot of changes in the hyperparameters and the code, it just keeps on changing, right? Always changing. The complete opposite happens in production. In production, 
the data keeps changing. The models, well, you know, Netflix says something about several final models per hour, I think up to hundreds in some cases. It's insane, right? And hyperparameters, they do change, but not as much as in research. But the code, oh, the code will never change. If you change the code, you take the mask off. It's no longer production, right? But this doesn't really tell you about uh, the differences that will promote or uh, understand why and where and how to use pipelines in research. The moment you throw it onto a fake feature space that I invented, it becomes much clearer, okay? So what are we looking here? We're looking at an interface versus specificity. The interface is how you use the model. Um, think about expert only as something you downloaded from uh, papers with code and you need to go over it for a month before you understand how it works. And automatically is something that you uh, press a button and you get coffee. And specificity is, can it be employed to uh, many, many different scenarios, or is it hardwired for just a single thing? And basically, um, a holy grail type of model would be very, very flexible and very, very simple. And a useless model would be hardwired to something and <laughs> can only be used by experts. And research is in this quadrant. You get fairly flexible models, but really uh, uh, need experts to use. And production is the complete opposite. It's supposed to be a button press away and hardwired to a specific use case. In order to go from here to there, mostly people will go through a prototype stage where you lose some of the flexibility and you gain uh, some simplicity in terms of interface. And then someone, probably not the machine learning researcher, will move this to production. And this is the current situation. And I think this situation is bad. And you see a lot of people trying to address this distance and jump. And well, I, I don't think there is a, an immediate solution right now, maybe in the future. And there are many dif uh, difficult uh, barriers between this. And, but we'll not open this for discussion today. But you know, I have another analogy for you. If we go back to coffee, uh, the thing is that Researcher looks at his art coffee, artisan coffee, you know, you measure everything, it's, it's fresh and it's hipster and whatever, and it's good coffee. And the DevOps person looks at his encapsulated uh, hospital coffee automat uh, models and he says, oh, this is great, this is exactly what I need. They just put it here and they get button press away machine learning. And both of them are saying, who is in charge of this monstrosity? because for each of them, the other thing looks like a complete abomination. And what I think needs to happen is that we need to have compromise. And I think that the obvious compromise is in pipelines. The research code needs to be pipelined. The moment you put pipelines on research, you lose a lot of the flexibility. Yes, that's for sure. But you gain a leap in interface simplicity which means that when you have to go to the prototype st stage, you only move in terms of hardwiring it to a specific use case. And only then you can go to production by only moving in terms of making the interface simpler. It's a better process for all of the people involved. And I think that's something that we should consider as a community when we're inventing how to actually do stuff and getting out of the stone age of uh, machine learning. So, what is this compromise in terms of coffee? Well, it's a barista espresso machine. It has buttons to press and all the art form is uh, included in this loading of the, of the handle, right? Uh, and what does it mean in terms of uh, research? Well, it means that you're able to do rapid and reproducible iterations on complex experiments. This is something that you can't do now without pipelines. And if you use the pipelines in production, you won't be able to do as well. So it's a compromise. What's in it for us? Well, workflow orchestration, you decide when and where stuff starts and stop. Workflow version control, you run a pipeline, you have a complete tracking of what you ran. 
And something that you really like, and I think it's very important, it's called workflow parameterization. Okay, that means that you can make changes to the workflow without adding more code. You just need to change parameters and everything will uh, flow from it. And of course, if you're talking about pipeline, you, you're discussing modular code. So each element can be run on its own and it works. Okay, and again, the, the maybe hope, maybe promise, uh, maybe theory is that if your research is in pipeline form, it's a superior vantage point to go through production. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, I hear you tell me, you know, I don't care about production. I'm just here to solve a problem. Um, well, also, if you're just in research, you can uh, employ pipelines to gain benefits. It's an easy interface, less bugs, streamlining the entire, uh, the entire research process and gaining reproducibility. Uh, and it's all the name, the, the name of the game here is again encapsulation. In terms of coffee analogy, it's just taking uh, a process that is, uh, you know, not as good as a manual, and you can scale it easily by repeating the same thing once and for all. And we know this from scikit-learn, right? SKLearn, there's the pipeline, it's exactly this. You have one preprocessor, a bunch of classifiers, and you can use the same code you just iterate on classifiers and you fit for each classifier and you get the score. This is exactly what I'm talking about, you know, but this is just for SKLearn, just for a simple uh, exploratory uh, issue. What if you want more, right? Well, then first you need to answer the prerequisites. See if we have questions before we continue again, because this is something new. Great. It's now, no more questions. Maybe they will be in the end. Am I missing something? Yeah, interface versus specificity. In which quadrant do you suggest production sit? So as I said, production is in the upper right. It's hardwired to do one thing. It's supposed to be super simple, okay? Um, okay, are, are there anything in the Q&A? No, okay, let's continue. Okay, now, if you have been in my previous talk, you've seen this guy. This is the guy who can really increase the accuracy of the model, but he can't explain how he's done it because he's done so many attempts and experiments that he cannot uh, uh, retrace his steps. Okay, and there's a link here. You will be able to access the previous talk if you haven't. Now, um, how does this happen? Well, you train in a vacuum. You take this pipeline and you say, okay, I can do it manually. I will SSH into a machine and I will run my code. When it's done, I will take the model and copy it into my machine for further use. This represents a minimum in reproducibility. Okay, this is the lowest you can go. Now, even if you automate it, so you, you just uh, go into machines automatically, train them, and upload the models back in, it's still a bad idea. And why? Because when, when serious people show these diagrams, they don't tell you that there's a lot behind the scenes. And this is, you know, I, I, I purposely made it complex because I wanted to, to really show how, how messy it is. Sorry, no coffee analogy in this case. But, you know, if you really want to do research in a reproducible way, you need research MLOps. And the research MLOps is the, the right column here. These guys that track and collect all the things that always change. You always have uncommitted changes. You always change the model labels and you need to make sure that you notice. And here I also opened up this get data set into its uh, uh, canonical uh, uh, data pipeline that you start from raw data, you do some ETL, you split it, and then you, you can do training. All of this needs data provenance. And um, the, 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 ba the end result for this is that, you know, you don't have to worry about this. It's somebody else's problem. And neatly put, it's a platform's problem. And this is a slide from my previous talk, slightly modified. There's a medium uh, post that I've put exactly on this situation. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, okay? You have to 
track everything. And when I say everything, it's everything. It's even the the the, the shell variables of the uh, computer you first ran on. Okay, everything. Because otherwise, uh, you you can't have decent reproducible automation. And without automation, you can't get pipelines. And when I'm saying automations, I mean it, whatever you build runs on remote, i.e. cloud or whatever uh, machine that you're using or machines, and it will run exactly like it did on your developer box. And it will run the same today and in the future, no matter what, okay? Uh, and again, this, Ideally, in 2020, already you'll get this from your platform. If you're doing research without a platform, then stop, use a platform, and then continue. Now, let's take this and really distill it to the finest, most ingredients. What do you need to get to start working on pipelines? Okay, again, full tracking, including tracking of the pipeline. You need the ability to offload to remote execution because otherwise, you are stuck with the same, uh, you will be tempted to do everything manually. And also you don't gain parallelism. You want this workflow parameterization, which I think maybe we'll get some time to talk about. And obviously, and this is the real, the real thing, okay? It has to be that simple to use. If it's not simple, you won't do it. And if you won't do it, you'll, temp you'll be tempted to do stuff manually. And then you will have, issues. Now, let's say you buy into my idea, okay? You either want to improve your research or you want to improve the standing of your research versus production, which is a, these are different pain points, right? But they both are answered by employing pipelines in research. Um, how do you do it, right? Uh, you can't just take any pipeline and do it because, uh, well, let's see why. Let's say you, you decide on building the entire thing on your own. That means you will spend most of the time doing that and not research. So I'm scratching that off, okay? You don't do, you do it yourself. Now, most people I discuss this thing with, well, it's not a lot of people because this idea is kind of new in my brain, but they said, you know what? We can do it because we already use Airflow for production. Apache Airflow, by the way, open source. Um, and we can maybe do adaptation to use research for it. Okay. And other people say, you know, yeah, we can maybe take our existing uh, research code and uh, put, put some uh, open source library on top of it. You guessed it, Airflow. <laughs> uh, or, and that's what I'm suggesting, let's grow the pipelines using existing MLOps. What do I mean by, by growing? And that's actually the bottom-up uh, approach for design. Uh, the People equate this with Lego bricks. I don't think Lego bricks is really bottom-up because uh, it's still Lego in the end because you don't get something new. It's just made out of Legos. Uh, bottom-up is actually like this small terrarium, okay? You start with elements and you build it up. Um, and how does it work for, uh, for, for, for our case? Well, the first stage is getting something to be standalone working, your train.py. Uh, that's not easy to do, I know, okay? Unless you start from a ready-made repo and then, you know, you can skip stage number one. Stage number two, uh, used to be hard. It's how to integrate this with the platform for remote execution and tracking everything, like I said. But nowadays, um, most of the leading open source uh, platforms offer you this with two lines of codes. Now, getting it to work uh, on any remote machine should be zero line of code. Okay, that's we're narrowing it down a little bit, but this is the stages. Now. The fourth stage is actually the last stage for this step. Whenever you run a remote and it works and it is, it's integrated inside the platform, it should already be able to be used as a template for running more and more experiments, which are parameterized differently. 
Okay, so whatever works for you has already become a valid pipette stage. Then you take all the other steps that you want. And when you have all of them, you have a pipeline. Now, let's reconsider all the approaches I've said before, okay? How to do it? Well, if you use an existing pipeline that you already have, it won't be the best fit for the job. I agree. I mean, you would agree with me. Sorry, I, of course I agree with myself. Um, but if you take a dedicated tool that you haven't used before, or you use my bottom-up approach, uh, it will be tailor-made to your own workflow, which is nice. Now, in terms of execution, uh, pipelines in production tend, tend to be robust. So if you use that, you're in the clear. Uh, any tailor-made tool that you make from uh, plopping down a library will scale well. You just have to do it yourself because eventually you are using something that can be used in production. And if you're using the bottom-up approach, well, it's only as good as your platform. So you need to use a platform that can really uh, handle this. Um, now, this is the tricky part, right? Uh, whenever you use something like Airflow, and there are other uh, tools, of course, I'm just saying Airflow because that's the standard everybody compares to. Uh, you build one pipeline, okay, that's hard enough. But then if you want to iterate on the design and change and, and, and decide that you want to do something differently, every time it's a process, okay? And also, even if you do it, uh, if you want to do, uh, to take something that you've made already and use it for something else, uh, it's not a straightforward uh, a question. Uh, can, I, can I actually use the same thing twice? It's flexible. Okay, but in the in the growing approach, because you, you make everything as elements for pipelines, uh, you get this for free. Okay, it's, it, it clicks together by design. This is why I like it. Uh, and, and I guess uh, it's not so, so good to show in the presentation form. Uh, we'll discuss it later, uh, but um, this, this is kind of how it looks like uh, in, in our uh, open source platform. And really, it shouldn't look like anything else anywhere. And uh, I'm expecting that you'll see much, many things like this, right? So there are no, I mean, no code changes for code that already works. You declare everything in a single file. Uh, you, there's a pipeline, exactly like we've seen in, in, in scikit-learn. But here you add a step, you, you name it, you, tell, you declare the dependencies in terms of parents. Then you have to say, you know, inside my experiment tracking platform, where I'm taking the template from, and what's the name of the task that is going to be the template. And then you do parameter override, you parameterize it. In this case, for example, we're adding a step that's calling process that starts from the data and it just changes the, the link to the data set with the link that's output from the previous stage, right? So there's a bit of domain specific language here, but it's really easy and it's to be expected. There's a, you have to make a compromise somewhere. But it's not like you have to write an entire YAML file for this. It's, uh, and, and whenever you, you get this magic keyword that you need, you can always use it in any other situation. And then orchestration should be something like this, as simple as this, start, wait, stop, okay? Uh, and we're gonna get many code examples for this and, and uh, we can discuss it later uh, offline if you want. Now, I thought really hard about how to present examples for this. And I've taken a, a, a liberty to, to do it in the most unprofessional way possible. Okay, there are not gonna be any nice, uh, nicely conforming diagrams. I'm going to use a lot of arrows and a lot of colors, uh, but uh, I just want to make the message clear that uh, it's, it's, it has to be as simple as that. You have to be able to write something on the whiteboard without knowing how to do UMLs because you're a researcher, connect some lines together 
and then you know sitting for a few minutes and say well you know what i have all of these components already and i can just declare the pipeline simply and it will work just like the interface for the cat here for the water he knows how to drink it just doesn't need to change anything the water will come exactly like that so we start simple we get the same uh, demo data set in model out and again there are a lot of things behind the team you have to have them if you don't have the the reproducibility and the tracking and everything it's not going to work for you okay and whatever you you're going to see here is not supported by all the pipeline tools that are here that, that, are, that exist currently but uh, it will be in the future of course i think uh, especially for uh, our tool um, now the most obvious thing you can do is to separate the validation out. Uh, why would you do that? Well, mainly because you train on eight GPUs and validation is not, is not parallel and you don't want to write parallel code for it and you don't care that you can run it on CPU. So you, 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 while you train, you get the model out and you, then you, you, you have another machine which does not has a, have a GPU and it runs the validation. Well, it's a small, small saving on costs. And it also has the advantage of actually separating the machines. So you're, you're really sure that the, the, the validation and train set does not intermix unless you want them to, hint, hint. Uh, but this, this isn't really a, a motivation to use pipelines. Maybe this is a better motivation to use pipelines. It's the same thing, but now the train process, it generates checkpoints as it goes. And all these checkpoints are automatically uploaded to the hub or model storage, whatever you want to call it. And the fact that they are uploaded triggers uh, another process called the validation to run the validation stage and generate validation results for each checkpoint. Uh, I call it a test while train. Uh, it's basically the same thing you would do if you you would use the original demo pipeline but again here you have a machine that does not utilize eight gpus and it runs the validation while the machine that has eight gpus does not stop for validation it's always churning more and more and more models uh, this this is a translate to an impressive savings on the time and money and uh, also, it enable, enables you to do this early stopping that we all like, which is uh, early stopping my finger. You, you put your thumb into the wind and then you know if you want to early stop or not uh, based on the validation result. Uh, and you, you, you don't have, if you ever want to go back a checkpoint or two checkpoints back, it's all available to you. Um, but also that's not the, the best uh, uh, motivator for Pipelines, I think this one is, okay? There are, this is called the student teacher pipeline. And there are many processes that, uh, the, that use it. For example, knowledge distillation or compression, also continuous learning. Uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward if you draw it like me. If you have to, if you have to adhere to conforms, uh, to, uh, then it won't be as simple, but here it's simple. You have a data set, uh, you do a train, you get a model. The moment you get a model, there is another train process which has a different loss uh, that uses this model and this data set to get another model and you keep both of them, okay? Uh, why is this important? Uh, for example, if this is a, a fairly complex and heavy uh, GPU intensive model, and this is something that can run on your new uh, uh, Mac laptop that now have a special chip that runs TensorFlow right here. Uh, you want to do inference there, but you need to compress the model. So how do you do it? You do, you do uh, in, in knowledge distillation, uh, sorry, compression by uh, uh, using the, the output of this model on the same data uh, inside the loss. And there are examples for this online, we can discuss it later. Uh, and this is uh, important, if you have this with research pipelines, it means that you can, for example, modify it, that, every, that you run the entire pipeline once, and then you run it again, and you, you change something on the train two, but train one did not change, and then 
uh, when you run it again, it will see that the model one exists already and that it will not run this train. You only run this. Uh, this is, I think, very comfortable. But the, the thing that I like most is that, you know, you, you can modify this one and have here hyperparameter hyper optimization without needing to change anything else. And speaking of hyperparameter optimization, what about having two successive hyperparameter optimizations? Uh, why is this important? Well, if you have parameters that you know that they are decoupled, for example, I don't know, um, uh, learning rate and the uh, type of, uh, of optimizer. I don't know. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, you don't want to do a search of both parameters together because then you just waste money uh, trying to discover if this is useful or not. And it will not be useful because they are decoupled. And uh, what you can do is you can do a small, a tight search over sim simple parameters and get a model that is good and then use that model, for example, as a starting point and use the parameter set as a starting point for hyperparameter optimization where you do other parameters. And then you get a winner and this is the model that you actually keep in the parameter sets. Uh, and it's easier to manage this way. It saves a lot of money and time. And also, let's say you want to redo the same thing, but you want to switch uh, entry, entry, entry point into the second hyperparameter set. Well, if you're using pipelines, it's just you know saying, instead of using this, use that, go. It's not writing other code. It's not going into, you don't, you don't even have to, write, uh, to go inside uh, an editor to do it. You can always uh, uh, manage this from, uh, from the, from the uh, uh, experimentation platform. And uh, you know, we've discussed several ones and there are many other pipelines that you can do. Uh, I'm expecting that uh, you know, as, as more and more research pipelines uh, will be used, you'll get more code for them, uh, especially platforms that are open source. Um, and you know, I just hope that this is enough for you to, to consider uh, using um, uh, even thinking about using research pipelines, uh, pipelines for research in your uh, in your uh, ongoing work, um, and if you do so, um, let's just uh, make sure that you you, you follow you know, the reasoning, uh, so you don't uh, uh, find yourself uh, expecting something that you. Um, did not sign up for uh, signing up for something you did not expect. Okay, so um, everybody thinks that you no, know, everybody thinks that research should be sharing the pipeline with production. You no, know? because if you do it, then there is no problem of going from research to 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 production. But that's easier said than done. Okay, currently it's it's a pain and it's it's almost never never is the case. Uh, and I'm suggesting that, you know, uh, decoupled from this, uh, from this fact, okay, use the research envelopes to go the pipelines for your own benefit and your own workflow and creativity and, and reproducibility. But uh, if you use them and you create pipelines in your work, this just might help your uh, research transition into production is more easily. And again, I'm emphasizing here, I did leave out the most important stage that's actually getting the data set and I apologize for it. And um, uh, we, we might be able to uh, answer some questions about it in the Q and A that follows now. Um, I re am really thanking you for joining here today because uh, uh, I think this platform, this AI camp is a privilege. I can, I can feel a new idea like this and get people that, that will actually uh, engage with me uh, on, a, on a very um, positive basis. So um, let me just put the link right here on the chat and we can go to the chat and see if there are questions. And I'm guessing that we uh, that we want to uh, discuss uh, um, 
the next session, uh, but uh, we'll leave it for when we're done with this. Where's the chat? There is the chat. Okay. Now, here is the link. Uh, do share it with your friends. And basically, this will be available in YouTube real quick. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here you are, guys. Thanks for coming. And okay. Base lines and ablation experiments. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, can I can I get my screen back so you can you can see me? Oh, ah, wait. Maybe do I have, do I have a slide for that? No. Oh yeah, actually yes. Okay. So, based on the ablations, um, see that's that's something that you should do in an ex in a, uh, inside an experiment uh, tracking platform, because then you will be able to to do. Um, okay, let, let 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 let's let's just do these two slides. Okay. Uh, you have a platform which gives you this reproducible orchestration. I have, haven't said anything about pipelines. Okay, just able to 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 uh, take a code, uh, track everything, make a change. Of, you don't even have to do a git commit. You can run it again, and you can always reproduce the result and compare with others. Okay, now baseline and ablation is exactly uh, fanning out from runs that work and adding small modification. Okay, we all, because uh, ablations in, in research is just, you know, we're thinking about many, many ideas, and then we're showing you step-by-step uh, 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 step how removing them actually changes the result. But it's supposed to be the other way around. You're supposed to, you're supposed to add more things uh, and check how the, the, the adding them changes things. And you do it within a platform. You don't really need the pipeline for that. Um, but the moment you have a pipeline, uh, the moment you've ran several abla ablations, uh, you can form a pipeline from them. And then if you want to add more an, a, another idea, you just add another step in the pipeline. I hope this answered your question. Uh, uh, is there a way to do a project with it and publish it to show others? Uh, Maya, hi. Um, well, um, yes, there is. And uh, it's a good place as any to, talk, to, to, to say it. Um, trains, uh, the moment we came out with it, we, we have seen a great adoption in industry because people have the resources to raise uh, to, to do their own uh, train server. Uh, but uh, we haven't seen a lot of uh, single use adoption. Uh, people don't want to uh, set up uh, dockers on their own uh, laptops just to have a server. And this is why we're going to come out with a free, completely free hosted uh, service um, for trains. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be named trains. Uh, and it, you, you will be able to share stuff from there uh, with the pipelines. All you need is to get your own resources to do the runs. And uh, I'm actually going to do some sharing of uh, pipelines using this platform the moment it will come up. And I think it just depends on the timing, either the next session or two sessions from now, I'm actually going to, to do some live coding or maybe have a semi-workshop semi of getting a pipeline to work with Allegro Trains, um, maybe even inside the Jupyter Notebooks, I don't know. I just have to make sure that uh, we can uh, uh, put everything in a time frame of a webinar. Yes. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, follow me or, or Allegro on Twitter for the to, for the formal announcement of the pro, of the of the platform. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, you can always use our demo server if you're just uh, learning stuff for your own. We have a demo server that's always up. Uh, when you install trains on your Python on your Python environment, you add the two lines to your code. Yes, it will put the results up there and it will be viewable by everyone. But if you're just learning, it, you, you're not supposed to care. Uh, it's zero, zero hassle, right? You just put the two lines and it's there. Um, 
So do try it, and we have uh, a lot of videos uh, showing you how to do it. I even gave a small demo in the previous session of this uh, webinar. Um, more questions? Oh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, did I miss something? Uh, great, <clears throat> great. If you have more questions, please post to the Q&A. Uh, and if you prefer to speak to ask questions, you can raise your hand and we have a few more minutes. Uh, you can, yeah, so we can unmute just, you to speak. Yeah, let me just uh, show you the people wanted the link. Okay, so this is the demo app. Where's the chat? I'm always losing the chat window. Um, There it is. Okay, so this is the demo server. Okay, see, you just have to put your name in here. You can go to GitHub and see everything. And uh, and you can, um, if you, uh, I'll post the link later if you want a small introduction. I don't want to do a lot of, uh, of uh, um, um, you know, even though it's open source, I don't want to really push you onto this platform because there are many other platforms that are open source and uh, free to use. Uh, I think ours is the best, but uh, you know, I want you to decide for your own. Um, and that's it, you know. Um, so basically what you're seeing on my screen uh, in the near future will be something that you can log in with uh, securely with your, I don't know, uh, uh, Gmail account or GitHub account. And then you can do the same thing that you do here on this server, but it's going to be uh, protected for your own uh, personal use uh, under some terms and uh, conditions. Great. Um, uh, by the way, is it it's a free to try out, right? It's always free. Okay, it's great. Complete, it, okay, okay. So we have questions in the Q and A. Uh, basically, you know, let me say a thing about this. Uh, our business model is not this platform. This platform is something that we share that's open source, not for the betterment of, United, of humankind. We actually enjoy the engagement from the community. We get feature requests that people need. It allows us to be flexible and get whatever people actually need in research in the industry. Uh, the, our business model is the enterprise version. It's a, it's, it's a complete data management thing that I've not even discussed. Okay, so yeah, um, how do you convince key, key stakeholders to adopt MLOps in research if it needs to be platform independent? Uh, Vasily, it's exactly why we've done, let me just give you a thumbs up on this. Yeah, uh, this is exactly why we've launched it as open source. Uh, it's, if you look at our videos of how to install this, it will take, I mean, even me that I don't know Kubernetes, I was able to launch it on the Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Even you can do it without Kubernetes. All you need is, uh, um, you know, just the uh, uh, ability to install some packages on, on, on a remote machine. And we have images ready. And because it's open source, you don't need to convince key stakeholders. You can just tell them, you know, I want to use this. Let's see how it works. And you do a small POC. And really hit me up on, uh, on our Slack channel or Reddit or LinkedIn, or whatever. And I will uh, help you convince your key stakeholders. And Chris, can you talk about how you choose your stages for the pipeline? For example, what if you have a stage that is currently a large piece of code and you decide to split it up? Okay, Chris, this is, uh, I, I didn't want to sp uh, specifically talk about it, but this is the real uh, disadvantage for um, uh, taking uh, something that exists and, and putting it, uh, trying to pipeline it. Because uh, what happens in a lot of places, especially in Airflow, that because people want to share data between steps, they lump everything into a big script and then it's a single stage. Uh, and and when, when, when it's there, it's really hard to rewrite it, right? And it's really hard to convince people to change the code, code that works, because if you change it, it might break. Uh, uh, how to decide and speed it up? Well, uh, it's exactly how you decide to refactor a, a program. You just, uh, you diagram and you see where the dependency is only data, and then you can disconnect it. And it's, it's really easy to do it if you're just, you know, taking 
bits of code and copy pasting them into another file. And you can use the existing refactoring tools for this. And then you just add the two lines for uh, lines of code that will integrate the file with the platform, and then you get two steps. Um, based on that, you know, for example, uh, if you have uh, how how I would do it. Um, the thing is that you know there's a unspeakable uh, thing in the pipelines that if you need to move data around uh, and you're using different machines, that's it's going to take a while, and uh, that that really needs a good caching mechanism. Uh, that uh, if you're doing it once, if you do it the second time, you don't have to do it again. And actually, our our platform and Dev and MLOps. Uh, they already have this built in, so I'm not even thinking about it. Okay, Stefan, uh, how could you try the demo? I provided the link, good. Um, oh, but so uh, the package is Apache 2, I think, uh, and the server is uh, because there's some elastic code there, there's some. It's a little bit different, but still, it's really you can you can fork it today, you can change the logo and and re-upload it and and nobody would would uh, would say anything, okay? Uh, it's really open source, um, and, and basically what you're getting is this, right? Uh, let me show you this. We still have a, a one minute before it ends, so I will use it, okay? Uh, excuse me, my my nineties uh, uh, world out, but um, uh, you get trains. Which is the Python package, train server, which is the server, and train agent, which is the package, the, the agent that works on the remote machine. And once you get them all installed and running up, that's it. You, you have a full working MLOps platform with which uh, with resource tracking. Uh, and you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to to take up more of your time because it's already uh, one hour. So oh, more questions, good. Um, Oh, not all the questions. So I've answered all of the questions. And I put the link here in the chat. And do focus on GitHub and star us and stuff. And uh, hit me up on uh, whatever platform you like. Um, and thank you very much for the questions. And uh, you know, even if you have further questions later, just try the YouTube. I, I might go and see if there are other questions. Um, okay. Thank you very much.